Hi, my name is Andrea Capere, and you're watching Mission Nonprofit. Each month, we connect with local organizations and agencies that are making a positive impact in our communities. We've invited John McNamara and Miles Nowlin from the Northwest Cooperative Development Center to talk about their work. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. So tell us, tell us about the center. Uh, we are a, a 501c3 mm -hmm. organization. We provide services through uh, to the Pacific Northwest states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Our primary uh, focus is helping people develop and support uh, cooperative businesses in, in, the, in their communities. And tell us about that cooperative business model. So cooperatives are organizations that usually have an economic purpose, they generally do, and they operate on the basis of a one member, one vote. So they're pretty much any type of business you might normally see, except the purpose is to meet the needs of the members. So uh, food co-ops are pretty common that most people know. That's for helping the members there get the foods, the access to the foods that they want. Uh, housing co-ops help people uh, get housing that they need. Uh, work, uh, worker co-ops uh, are about employee-owned businesses mm -hmm. that operate, again, not so much on a profit model, but on a meeting the member needs model. So a worker co-op might be more focused on decent wages, benefits, and safe working conditions, for instance. And then producer co-ops are usually help uh, farmers and other agricultural producers access marketplaces that they might otherwise not have the ability to do. Is that like a CSA? Or? Um, it can be CSAs. Uh, apple orchardists, for instance, mm -hmm. a small apple orchard, or like Organic Valley is a pretty well-known uh, dairy cooperative. Those are small farmers with maybe you know, 20 to 50 animals, and they wouldn't have the market power to be able to get a, a decent price for their milk. But with through the co-op model, they're able to get a significantly better price. And it's it's an uh, it's a model that sort of straddles nonprofit and private sector, right? Right. So it's it's not for profit in the sense that the purpose of the organization is not to maximize return on investment. The purpose of the organization is to meet the needs of the members, which may be creating equity and and uh, you know access to markets. But uh, it's something that we kind of say we'd cost neutral is the idea. The mm -hmm. idea is that you're running the business to meet your expenses and to provide your needs, not just to amass wealth. And so, how did the Northwest uh, Cooperative Development Center? Uh, begin? How did it come to being? <laughs> well, way, way back in 1979, okay. uh, a number of relatively large co-ops in the state of Washington, uh, PCC in Seattle, REI, uh, Group Health Cooperative, and a few others came together and felt that there was a need to have uh, uh, more of a presence and to start sharing the information about co-ops. So they created the Northwest Co-op Development Center. And it was a pretty loose-knit group and uh, with function. And in 1986, it applied for and became a 501c3 so that it could apply for grants and start providing technical assistance. And then in 2003, our executive director was hired with specifically to move it into sort of a new phase of technical assistance. And then we got involved with another national group called Rock USA that uh, focuses on housing co-ops. And so during that time, we've kind of grown from what was a pretty small organization to being a, a very full service co-op development center. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it's a somewhat of a non-traditional model, the co-op, in my understanding. Right. So I'm wondering, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but what are some of the challenges faced by small emerging co-ops? Well, we we uh, <clears throat> we tend to uh, work with people who aren't necessarily primed to be business owners, and we basically are teaching them how to be business owners, but to be business owners in a democratic format. So in a traditional corporation, your voting power is based on how much equity of the business you own. In a cooperative, it separates the money from the voting power. So regardless of how much equity you have or how long you've been in the business or anything else, you still only have one vote as a person. So the, the common denominator in a co-op is the human being. The common denominator in most other businesses is the dollar. And so that's kind of the fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. And because of that, then we, are, we often have people who maybe have not 
had a lot of experience in, in that sort of organization, and we help train them on governance, how to run a meeting, how to read financial statements, and how to also engage in a, a process where it's uh, trying to find what's best for the whole group, not just for one or two individuals that have the most votes, mm -hmm. which uh, is not something our society always trains people to do. Right. <laughs> so, you know. so what are some of those uh, sectors or issue areas that you work in? Um, one of our bigger areas in the worker co-op world right now are home care cooperatives. Uh, so home care uh, is becoming a fast-growing industry with the aging population in this country. Uh, these workers tend to be minimum wage workers with less than full-time work. Mm -hmm. uh, most home care workers are considered to be in poverty. Um, and so we are working with home care workers uh, right now in three or four different cities in Washington where they're usually able to have uh, decent wages, like $15 an hour or better, mm -hmm. uh, have benefits, get a share of any surplus that they are able to generate, and also you know, pick up their skills. And part of it is, is really about the human development aspect. And so home care is kind of a, a really big one because it's a fast growing industry. It's also an industry where people generally are not treated very well as the mm -hmm. workers. And so we're trying to flip that, that around, I guess. And um, uh, also, uh, our sort of half of our business is with residential owned communities, mm -hmm. which are manufactured housing parks that we help the uh, the residents uh, purchase and then run. And Miles, that's kind of more Miles's mm -hmm. focus. And maybe I don't know if you want to just jump in. Or Miles, let's talk <laughs> sure. to you about it. Tell yeah. us about yeah. uh, residential resident owned communities. Yeah, yeah, resident owned communities. Um, so this was a concept that uh, rooted out of New Hampshire in the 80s. Uh, a group of young grad students saw the injustices happening um, within the manufactured housing business, mm -hmm. namely that um, people owned their homes, but they didn't own the land under their homes mm -hmm. and were vulnerable to that land being sold um, for profit, in which case maybe a new owner came in mm -hmm. and then the next year a new owner and rents went up, up, up and up. Um, or the land was sold for redevelopment purposes to, for example, put in a Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore these, quote, mobile homes and uh, mobile home owners were forced to move. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is mobile homes um, in the business, we like to refer to them as manufactured mm -hmm. homes because they're actually not that mobile right. at all. <laughs> um, especially older models um, uh, tend to deteriorate when you move yeah. them. Some of them you actually are not allowed to move due to local laws mm -hmm. or state laws. Um, and of course, to move a home can cost upwards of ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Um, and then, of course, remembering that manufactured housing is a housing option for often very low-income people, seniors, mm -hmm. um, you know, people who are traditionally marginalized in, in our society. So they saw this, this opportunity to say, you know what, why don't we sell these parks to the residents? Um, and they started kind of a, a small pilot project. Um, and expanded that throughout the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, Rock USA, Resident Owned Communities USA, was formed by a gentleman named Paul Bradley and um, his partners to go national and to take the model that he um, and, his, and his group had started in New Hampshire, take it national, um, and to bring on nonprofit affiliates to basically spread the model um, and to do the good work in other states. Mm -hmm. So in actually the first year of Rock USA, Northwest Co-op Development Center joined as an affiliate of Rock USA okay. and formed what we call Rock Northwest mm -hmm. um, to do the resident owned communities here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So how many communities do you have in your service area? Here in Washington, we have 14. Wow. Yep. So over the past 11 years, we've helped to convert um, 14 uh, mobile home parks into resident-owned. 
um, and we also carry forward um, typically about 10 years of technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So again, similar to the work that John does uh, in the broader co-op world, offering training, um, advice, coaching, and, and so on to um, do our best to make sure that these communities are successful mm -hmm. um, and carrying forward the, the business of providing affordable housing um, to their members. Mm -hmm. It sounds yeah. like a life-changing opportunity for someone to move from paying exorbitant lot rent mm -hmm. to then move to um, you know, a place of, as you said, owning the ground beneath them. Yes, yes. Um, it is a proven um, concept. Um, there's over 200 communities across the country. Mm -hmm. None of them have ever defaulted on their mortgages. Um, but a lot of that is attributed to the technical assistance piece. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're not just helping them purchase and then letting mm -hmm. go, but really offering that, that support throughout. Um, as far as you mentioned the rents go, um, yes, a lot of communities do have jacked up rents. Mm -hmm. um, and our goal is to, to come in, offer them the opportunity to purchase with the technical assistance and the finance um, in the hopes that they don't have to raise their rent. Now, it's quite often that to make the deal work, we have to ask the membership to vote mm -hmm. to possibly raise their rent by 10 to 50 bucks mm -hmm. um, a month. Um, but we, we never ask them to go far above the market values um, because we want to make sure it's a good deal for the residents. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's been trending over the last 10 years is that these rents stabilize. So private manufactured home communities, rents typically go up about 5% a year on mm -hmm. average. We've also seen some horrible cases where rents go up 15% in one year mm -hmm. um, or more. And rocks, resident communities typically uh, only go up by about 2%. And in some cases, never go up. And so that's the real pitch. Mm -hmm. The investment in purchasing the community is not an equity investment. It's an investment in the future of stable, um, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any success stories to share regarding uh, rock or maybe even some of the um, work related co-ops? You want me think to go? Back? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you go I, with the rocks. So like, think of one. <laughs> um, what's, uh, I'll say, for, to preface this, I'll say that um, we are challenged in the developer's market to mm -hmm. convert, to support the conversion of, of communities that are in more urban areas. We're just getting outbid like crazy, mm -hmm. right? So these are high dollar investments. Um, and so we often go after communities that are more rural or maybe sometimes have bigger repairs that are needed and we do our best to bring in the financing and make a competitive bid and, and get the deal through. Um, and we had a unique community in Moses uh, that we converted in Moses Lake last year mm. that closed in, I believe, September. It was about um, 25 mobile homes and 15 of which were uh, owned by the park. So that's pretty rare. Usually mm -hmm. the, um, the resident owns their home and the private landlord owns the land. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we had to um, figure out a way to um, purchase the homes and then transfer the homes to the new residents. Mm -hmm. um, this was also an interesting case because it was uh, I want to say 95% Latinx community, mm -hmm. um, mostly El Salvadorian immigrants. So folks that have not been necessarily in the U.S. for very long or are learning their second, sometimes third language. Yeah. Um, and so we weren't sure how the community was going to respond to this opportunity. Um, and on one of our first member meetings that we held, um, we had a much higher than expected turnout. I believe about 30 house, uh, I, almost all of the households mm -hmm. showed up. Um, kids running about and um, you know, interpretation happening over here and slideshow happening over here and it was mm -hmm. a little bit chaotic. Mm -hmm. And we were going to basically ask, would you be okay with a rent increase and how would you feel about actually purchasing your home? 
some of them, um, most of them, um, for the first time as, yeah. as homeowners. So I think our anticipation was that people would be nervous, scared, mm -hmm. maybe there'd be a lot of questions. There's often um, a lot of concern that we're coming in as some kind of scam, right. um, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. We're working with very vulnerable populations who traditionally have been taken advantage of in mm -hmm. these kinds of economic situations. Um, and everyone raised their hand in support to move forward without much question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we were, we were surprised by that and, and also excited because we were very nervous about this deal. We were wondering, I think, the entire eight months of this conversion, whether this was the right thing for this community. Yeah. So we were always going back and, and checking in with them. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, they purchased and they got a, a, good, a good deal on the community. And there are 15 new homeowners who are now running the community on their own. Um, and so far, so good. That's a great success yeah. story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, John? Um, you know, we, we here in Olympia, we actually have quite a few. It's yeah. kind of hard to pick one. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, about five years ago, uh, the New Moon Cafe start, mm -hmm. successfully converted uh, the cafe to a worker-owned business. And, you know, five years is great uh, uh, for any, any business, especially uh, a restaurant. And they are, are still thriving. But since then, that... Uh, since then, we have added several more co-ops. So, I mean, just in downtown Olympia, there are uh, five different worker co-ops, That four of which started since New Moon, so Dumpster Values uh, converted last year. Oh, that's There's great. a construction co-op. Yeah. There's a, a accounting co-op. Capital Home Care uh, provides uh, home care to all of Thurston County that they are just celebrated their first year. Uh, and actually, right now, uh, Olympia has more worker co-ops per capita than anywhere else in, North, in the United States. We have, so if you think, like we have 10. Mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco, which is kind of the epicenter of worker co-ops, has 42. And New York City, all five boroughs, has 45. And wow. we have 10. And we have like 50,000 people. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> so, phenomenal. It is phenomenal. So it's, it's Olympia is kind of the success story mm -hmm. right now. It's a lot of a lot of energy. Uh, there's a really strong uh, sense of cooperation in this part of the, the country, mm -hmm. which goes back way back into the history of, of the Sound and the Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, yeah, there are all a lot of successes here right now, which is exciting, mm -hmm. and more more coming. So, and I'm, I'm sure there's more cooperative development councils across the country. There are, there's about 20, I think 27 okay. centers throughout the country, uh, different stages of their own development and, and work. And we communicate through a national group called mm -hmm. Cooperation Works and share uh, practices and train each other and mm -hmm. resources and, and have general meetings and trainings throughout the year to keep our skills up and learn from each other because everyone's doing a lot of different stuff and projects, so. Yeah. yeah. Is there something that makes your organization stand out from those? Um, you know, I think one thing that we are is uh, we are very focused on being out in the field with the people and, uh, and we're very focused on training people up to basically take over and do it. And uh, not that the others aren't doing that, but um, we don't do as much research. We don't spend a lot of administrative time on fundraising, which probably you know limits what we can do. But uh, I would say probably even our, even everyone in our office is in some way engaged out in the field for the majority of their time. Yeah. And uh, and so, and I think we have a real commitment to being as efficient as possible. So, you know, when we come into a rock and, you know, resident-owned community, we have the trained staff and we're ready to go. And when when folks come in, we, we're, we're ready for it, we're, to work with them where they are and, and get them where they need to go. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't think the other centers aren't doing that, but just some have a more research focus. Some mm -hmm. have different areas that they really f in, uh, focus on. Uh, we tend to be more generalists, so yeah. we'll, we'll work with anyone doing the co-op model, or you know even nonprofits as long as they're using a democratic uh, governance model. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, I think we're a little bit we're unique. 
and and we tend to have more staff than we're relatively large with with eight people on staff. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought up fundraising because I'd love to ask, how can the community support you? <laughs> uh, well, we uh, we don't necessarily have a formal program, but on our website at nwcdc.coop, uh, we do accept donations. We're always happy to accept donations. They can be earmarked for specific projects if we have uh, projects going on in the community that people want to support. And we do have some people that do that. They'll write uh, specifically a check for a food co-op that we're working okay. with or a worker co-op or you know you can even donate directly to the ROC program. We are trying to set up uh, a community development financial institution, mm -hmm. CDFI, uh, but that's still in the process. But once that gets up and running, we'll be, probably be more active in helping to fund that program as well. Are there any volunteer opportunities? There are many volunteer okay. opportunities. We are always happy for volunteers. And we've had great success with a number of interns from uh, the local colleges. Uh, but we uh, and our volunteers and our interns, we tend to put them to work in the field with us. So mm -hmm. it's not that they're you know, photocopying or doing right. office work, although we're always happy to have help doing that too. But uh, They're we, getting real they're, valuable they'll, work skills. Right, they'll be coming out working with clients with us. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I think we had one Evergreen intern uh, and another student at Evergreen that worked with one of our communities. Uh, some of the rocks are, are majority Spanish speaking, and so, you know, really uh, being able to work in those communities can be incredibly valuable to have native Spanish speakers with mm -hmm. us. Well, great. So, well, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm wondering, is there anything else you want to share? Any big plans? <laughs> well, there is one, I should say, and that's what our legacy project. Mm -hmm. We started it this year at uh, really at uh, the behest of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's uh, a program to help raise the profile of selling a business to one's employees. Uh, right now, um, there are more people retiring from the workforce that are entering the workforce. In rural communities, business owners who are getting ready to retire may have nobody to sell their business to. Mm. We're trying to work with lawyers and accountants and, and business owners to see the value of selling to their workers. Mm. It'll keep these sometimes legacy businesses around in rural communities instead of just disappearing. Right. Uh, it allows the owner maybe to actually have a retirement where otherwise they might just shut down the business and, uh, and it keeps the jobs that are there mm -hmm. too. And also gives people a reason to stay in rural communities. And right now that's a constant problem of depopulating rural communities. And so by keeping the jobs there and keeping the people there and and we keep that legacy alive. And so that's a, a major focus of a lot of our co-op work right now. Miles <laughs> and John, I really appreciate you both coming on today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, yes, you're absolutely. doing a lot of great work. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's all we have for you. You can see Mission Nonprofit on Channel 77 on Sundays at 4.30 p.m., Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 7.30 p.m., and Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. You can also catch us online at tcmedia.org. See you next time.